Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to all of you live and welcome to those of you um, viewing this recording. This is instructional course 30, Demystifying Seat Cushion Claims, How to Use Wheelchair Cushion Performance standard, Standards. Uh, my name is Dave Brianza. Um, Alex Delazio will be presenting and co-authors on the paper are myself and Tricia Karg. I will um, give the CEU, CEU code at the conclusion of the session. And I also uh, encourage everyone to enter their questions in the chat box. We will um, we'll, we'll, um, answer the questions at the end of the session. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Alex. All right, thank you so much, Dave, for that introduction. So hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra Delazio. Um, as Dave just mentioned, I work with uh, Dave Brianza and Tricia Karg in the Department of Rehab Science and Technology here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my background is in bioengineering, mechanical engineering, and medical product engineering. And I've worked uh, specifically on wheelchair seat cushions and testing those using performance standards. Um, so today we'll be talking about demystifying seat cushion claims and how to use those performance standards to assess and provide evidence for marketing literature. So as an engineer, I feel like it's very important to be able to communicate uh, very technical standards, very technical data into something that everyone can understand. So the clinicians, the wheelchair users, uh, the manufacturers, um, everyone out there, we can kind of create a level playing ground or a level playing field for everyone. So that's the goal of today's presentation. So as I mentioned, we're from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we are part of the Wheelchair and Cushion Standards Group. And um, we've been doing a series of webinars and launching a series of fact sheets and guidance documents all about using performance standards to help improve product quality and to evaluate different performance of these products. So we're part of a NIDLR funded rehab engineering research center on wheelchair and cushion performance. I mean, in actively translating these performance standards both nationally and internationally, um, and in a way that is understandable and effective for healthcare professionals, manufacturers, wheelchair users, researchers, and policymakers to implement and call upon in daily practice. So that's our mission overall. And what we've been up to to date, so how did we get here? We have been surveying over 30 cushions marketing materials, looking for patterns in marketing language and associated terminology. We've been talking with clinicians, wheelchair users and manufacturers to better understand the needs of each of those groups um, surrounding wheelchair cushion selection, as well as the production of those wheelchair cushions. And we've been testing over 50 wheelchair cushions varying in construction, material, and coding using standardized wheelchair cushion performance tests outlined um, by national and international standards organizations. We'll talk a little bit about each of those things today. And we've uncovered links between those commonly used marketing concepts, the customer perspectives of those that we talk to, and the standardized performance data that we've collected. And we'll discuss those links. So why are we talking about wheelchair cushion marketing literature? Let's start with that. When we did this, um, we looked at about 30 different cushions marketing literature that were pulled from our 50 cushion sample that we've been testing. And in there, we found certain patterns. We found that about 60% of those are talking about pressure relief, reduction, and distribution, those qualities of the cushion. About 50% of those marketing literature or brochures are mentioning stability. 30% mention the cushion's ability to regulate temperature or cool the user's bottom. 30% mention shear relief and reduction. 60% mention the protection of skin and tissue. 30% mentioned immersion. And about 65% mentioned the cushion's ability to envelop or conform to the user's bottom. And throughout the presentation today, we're gonna work through each of these terms, what they mean and how you can use performance data to kind of back up these claims. Because it's really important to not only understand, you know, what is pressure distribution? What is skin protection or immersion or stability? It's important to understand those terms 
but it's also understand it's also important to understand them so that you can understand what it is to be effective or ultimate or maximum or optimal in those categories. So you have to understand the term and then also understand how to kind of judge whether the cushion is actually meeting those claims or meeting those um, marketing language that, that are being used. So we might ask, where is the evidence showing whether or not you're meeting those claims or, or language? And with that, we ask the manufacturers to back up your marketing claims with concrete and meaningful data. And we ask the healthcare professionals and wheelchair users to ask questions about the meaning of and data supporting those marketing claims. So don't just take it at face value on either end. Make sure that there is data backing up the claims and make sure that when you as a consumer or a clinician are helping to find a cushion, you're asking what those things mean and not just reading what it says. And to generate data, as we mentioned before and have hinted at, we're gonna call upon the performance standards. So there's national standards um, that can be found by uh, the Rehab Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, who is the accredited body by the American National Standards Institute to create national performance standards for wheelchair seating and wheelchairs. There's also the International Organization of Standardization on an international level that'll help us find those standards and tests that we can run. And when I say performance standards, I mean test specifications describing the procedures to measure product performance using quantifiable, reliable performance metrics. So think of something that we're able to test on the cushion and then get a very reliable performance metric or outcome from that will give us kind of an idea about that cushion or its performance. So this will give us that outline, these standards. So let's get started talking about all of those things. To do that, we're gonna talk about the tool that we've introduced on our website. Um, it's a data exploration tool. Um, with that, what you can do is look at all of the data that we've collected for all of these cushions that we've talked about, the over 50 cushions that we've tested. You can see the standardized test metrics and data that we've collected for them. Throughout the presentation, you'll see icons such as this one, which we use for immersion. Um, and they will correspond with the tests on our website and on the tool. It will also correspond with a lot of the fact sheets and guidance documents we've put out on our website. So look for those icons as a symbol that um, you can click on and interact with. Once you go onto this tool, you'll be able to Click your icon, it'll take you right to a guidance about the test that it's discussing. And then you can click on one of the metrics. For example, this one be, would be loaded contour depth. And it will bring up a pretty big graph of data. And just to orient you with, with this data, um, each bar on these graphs represents an individual unique cushion with a unique construction and setup. The height of each of these bars represents the magnitude of the metric for each of those cushions. So for that um, particular graph you see here, it would be loaded contour depth. So the height of each bar represents how much loaded contour depth or immersion that that cushion would have. There's a black bar highlighted in each of these graphs as well. That black bar represents a reference foam cushion to kind of give you a reference on that graph. The reference foam itself is a three inch thick, high density polyurethane foam cushion covered in a two way stretch nylon spandex top uh, and non slip polyester bottom cover. So that's our reference foam that you can see throughout the presentation as well. Now that you're oriented with what it is, we encourage you to scan the QR code here on the slide and follow along on your phone if you'd like. Um, and just be able to kind of play around with the tool as we, as we go through this presentation. So I'll give you just a second to scan that if you're interested. Um, looking at the graphs, it's really important to look at it in landscape on your phone if you do do that. Uh, and we'll keep going here in just a second. All right. A couple quick background disclaimers, if you will, about this. All right, just a quick couple of background disclaimers if you, uh, as we go through this presentation. Um, manufacturers, do not panic. You're not going to be called out or identified through data 
or at all on the marketing side either. So we will not be identifying any manufacturer specifically when we talk about marketing language, um, nor will we with your cushion data. There will always be exceptions to the clinicians, the researchers out there. There's always exceptions to the guidance that we provide in terms of outliers or exceptions to what we talk about today for cushions. Not all of the standardized test procedures and metrics will be covered today. So the standards folks out there also don't panic. We, we aren't talking about everything um, related to those today either. Um, but all of the metrics we discuss are designed to compare cushions. Um, not necessarily a good or bad measure. It just depends on the performance of what you want for your client if you're picking a cushion. So again, this is a comparison um, data tool and just kind of giving connections to the metrics that you could you could use. And last but not least, we don't use real butts. Um, we don't use people when we do our testing. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. So we have cushion loading indenters. So when we're talking about all of this today, we're not talking about people necessarily, we're talking about a simulation of the pelvis. So these are four different or three different versions of a indenter, a cushion loading indenter that simulates the human pelvis that we use. They are rigid, um, to allow for standardized, repeatable testing and metrics. So that's something to keep in mind um, as you look at these results today. All right, so let's get started. We'll start with immersion. Our immersion tests um, we'll discuss in just a few minutes after we discuss a little bit about the language that's used. So we tend to see language such as designed for uh, increased immersion, total immersion, optimal or maximum immersion, um, it allows your pelvis to be immersed or the cushion allows the user to immerse into it. So those are some different lines that you could see in the language. And with that, we'll be showing you again these icons that correspond with our tool in, our, um, in each test, the test name, where it can be found in the standards, and then the metric associated with the test that we, we feel is a good match to the marketing literature. So with that, we'll talk about the loaded contour depth test. So a loaded contour depth uses an indenter that looks something like this. It has two cylinders that represent the ITs right here and here, and two buttons on the outside that represent the trochanter buttons. With this, the distance between the trochanter and the bottom of the um, cylinder for the IT is about 40 millimeters, representing the anatomy of a 50th percentile human pelvis. We will load that indenter into the cushion and wait about five minutes to basically see how much that indenter or the simulated pelvis sinks into the cushion. And with that, we measure loaded contour depth, which is the immersion of the base points of the indenter into the cushion. So you look for high loaded contour depth values to support marketing language that, the, that a cushion immerses the user or pelvis. So higher loaded contour depth, the more you're sinking in or, or in, um, immersing into the cushion. So if you see marketing language like designed to provide increased immersion, again, you're looking at that higher end of the scale. So cushions with a higher loaded contour depth. And again, we encourage you to follow along with the QR codes that you'll see throughout the presentation. The other test that we can talk about that measures immersion is the envelopment test. Now this test uses a bulbous indenter. So very similar to the other indenter, except now you have these um, semi-spheric round bulbous pieces of the, the bottom that you see here. Um, with that, you still have the ITs at the very tips of those bulbous indenter pieces, and you have trochanter buttons. But again, it's a more three-dimensional shape versus that single column. We would load it again into the cushion, wait two minutes, and see how much it immerses. And we would measure the standard load immersion. So again, the depth of immersion of the base points of that indenter at a standard load. So how much it's sinking into the cushion. And again, similar to the other measure for immersion, the higher load immersion values support language that a cushion immerses the user or pelvis. So we just hinted at envelopment. So let's talk about the 65% percent 
of cushion literature or marketing literature out there that mentions envelopment and conforming to the user's bottom. So you would see language such as conforms to the client's body, conforms to the tissue <clears throat> surrounding the ischial tuberosities, conforms to the sitter's unique shape, deforms to envelop the ischial tuberosities, maximizes envelopment, um, envelops your body, different language like that you would look for. And we would again use this envelopment test. But this time we're looking at something a little bit more specific and it's the pressure of the four elevations of immersion that are seen in this test. So you'd use the same bulbous indenter, but as you can see here, there's 18 sensors that are spread across the surface of this bulbous indenter. Each color represents a different elevation at which the, sense, the pressure is being sensed. So we look at the pressure at each of these different elevations. With the first elevation, elevation one, representing the ischial tuberosities, and then going all the way up to the um, highest elevation, which is your trochanter at E4, so elevation four. So again, you can kind of see how we look at different elevations of pressure with this test. And the main difference before we move on between immersion and envelopment, you can, you can see it here in this image below, is that envelopment is looking at how much the cushion is hugging your bottom. How much is it conforming to your bottom? How is the pressure distributed about the cushion around that, um, around your butt? Versus immersion is just how much are you sinking in? So we're taking it a step further with envelopment and looking at the conforming nature of the cushion. <clears throat> so you look for similar pressure values across all of the areas of your butt. Essentially, so similar pressure values at all elevations support marketing language that a cushion envelops or conforms to the user in the pelvis. So if you see marketing language, such as conforms to the sitter's unique shape, you would look for cushions with similar pressure values at all elevations. So you can see here the results of one of the tests that we ran. You can see how the, the pressures are very evenly distributed across those elevations. Each color represents a different elevation. One that didn't do so well is here on the other side. So you see the high pressures that are on the ITs. So you're getting really high pressures. You're getting high pressures in the red region as well, which is right around the IT. Then you're getting lower pressures at the trochanter level. So again, we would want something more where this the star is on this side of the slide for something like this. And since we're talking about pressure, we can transition to the 60% of marketing literature that references pressure relief, reduction, and distribution. So the language that's used is something like designed for pressure relief, optimal pressure redistribution, effective pressure redistribution, keeping excess pressure away from problematic areas, um, alleviating pressure on the bony prominences, eliminating pressure on the tailbone and spine, and significantly lower pressures uh, noted in the regions of the ischial tuberosities, coccyx, and sacrum. So different ways of all mentioning pressure relief. And again, we can learn something about pressure from the envelopment test and loaded contour depth test, but we'll also be talking a little bit about how pressure mapping can also be used. And when we mention pressure mapping here in this case, we're talking about it in a standardized test way not necessarily the same way it would be used in a clinic under a person. So we'll tell you a little bit about the technical metrics that we can pull from pressure mapping. But we'll start with the envelopment test since we're familiar with it already. So for envelopment, if you see marketing language like optimal pressure redistribution, you would look for cushions with a similar low pressure at all elevations. So you can see another image here with each of these squares representing one of the sensors of the 18 sensors that we have. All of the pressures are in this kind of blue region. So in, on our scale from zero to 500, we're pretty low. We're experiencing low pressures. And you can see again, this even distribution across the indenter into the cushion. And similarly here, when you look at by elevation, what the values were, very similar and low. If you saw something in marketing language that specifically called out the trochanter pressures, so it says that we would prevent against high trochanteric pressures, 
you would look for cushions with low pressures at elevation four. So this is a really good place to look at a specific thing like trochanter pressures, because we know elevation four, our green level here, represents trochanteric pressures. So you would have zero pressure on both of those areas. So this cushion does a good job of kind of evenly distributing pressure other places. It might not be super low, but it does distribute it across the board. And you have uh, zero pressure on those trochanters, which is what that claim is saying. You could also use something like Olivia's pressure on the bony prominences. And you could look for low pressures on that elevation one and two region. So you'd see here, <clears throat> excuse me, you'd have a lot of low pressure values in the regions of the ITs. And then on the outside, you'd have a little bit higher pressures on the trochanter. So it's kind of offloading um, the cushion or offloading your pelvis using that cushion. Similarly, we can talk about loaded contour depth to describe something about pressure distribution. If you saw language like optimal pressure redistribution, you would look for cushions with a high loaded contour depth. So something like cushion AV here would be a very good example of something that has optimal pressure distribution because it has a high loaded contour depth. And with that, we can move on to talk a little bit about our pressure mapping test. Now pressure mapping uses something called a rigid cushion loading indenter. Now this looks similar to the others, except the difference is it's, it's simulating your butt, but also the back of your thighs. So we have a little bit more surface area with this indenter. It doesn't necessarily tell us anything about our, our knees and feet or anything like that. So it's not a full, full picture, but it's gonna give you a good example of kind of your sitting in the cushion. But again, it's made of wood. So with that, we add a load to it. We put a pressure map beneath it and put it onto a cushion and wait about 60 seconds. Once that 60 second period is over, we'll see what the pressure map looks like. Now, something to keep in mind here again is it's different than a clinical pressure map. We're not just looking to see kind of qualitatively what it's doing. We're gonna look at specific measures to tell us a little bit about this cushion. We wanna know about contact area. Contact area is basically the total load bearing area. So anywhere you see um, any sort of reading on this map, that's what we're looking at. So how much is contacting the indenter um, on the cushion? We also look at specific regions here. So we'll call upon the sacral region in this area, and then two ischial tuberosity regions or base zones. And we can learn a little bit about those by using the peak pressure index and dispersion index. The peak pressure index <clears throat> is the average, excuse me, is the average of each ischial zone, which includes the peak pressure. So you have the right ischial zone being orange and the left ischial zone being yellow. The dispersion index looks at the portion of pressure supported in the sacral right ischial and left ischial zones. So we're looking at that whole region and how much pressure is supported in that. So for pressure relief, we're looking to see a high contact area and low peak pressure index and dispersion index values to support marketing language that a cushion has good pressure redistribution. So with that, if you see language like effective pressure redistribution, again, you're looking for that high contact area. So again, cushion AB or AV that we talked about before has very high contact area. We would also look for cushions with low peak pressure indices, because again, you want low pressures in the regions of the bony prominences. <clears throat> so you could again, look to cushion AV. Which has a low peak pressure index. Similarly, you could look for low dispersion index. And cushion AV again shows those similarities.
So a cushion like cushion AV shows high loaded contour depth, high contact area. Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. High contact area, low peak pressure indices, a low dispersion index. Similarly, you can see low pressures across all elevations for a cushion like AV on the envelopment test. With that, you have very low pressures across the board. Next, let's talk up a little bit about skin protection. And I'm actually gonna hand it over to Dave to talk a little bit about skin protection for one moment while I take a sip of water. <laughs> And I will have you just mention a little bit about the marketing language that's used for skin protection. Sure, go for it. So skin protection is something you see, um, claims about skin protection is something you see very commonly. 60% of all the cushions marketing material mention this. And there are kind of colorful comments on this, I think. Things like provides optimal skin pr protection or ultimate skin protection, or the very highest level of skin protection, superior, maximum optimal protection against skin breakdown. So you can see that um, you know, one of the main functions of the cushion is obviously to help prevent pressure injuries. So it's, I guess it's not surprising that manufacturers you know, feel uh, obligated or compelled to comment on how well their cushion does that. And so Alex, I will turn it back to you if you're ready. Absolutely, thank you for that. So with that, you have to think of a lot of different factors to talk about skin protection. We've talked about several of them already. We have immersion, pressure relief, envelopment. All of those different factors are all things that we've mentioned so far. But there's also things like uh, shear relief and reduction and temperature regulation that contribute to skin protection. And about 30% of the marketing literature out there mention those things. But right now, the standards for both of those are under development. But we can still talk a little bit about what each of those do in the meantime, as even though they're still under development. So for interface shear testing, you picture the same RCLI or rigid cushion loading indenter that we've been using, but you place a shear sensor under the ischial tuberosity region of that indenter. Then you place it on the cushion, and go ahead and pull it 10 millimeters and, and wait, a, wait about a minute and see how much force has built up underneath that shear sensor and how much force has been built up horizontally. So you look at both of those things and it tells you a little bit about how much shear your cushion is, is providing against the user's bottom. Similarly, you could look at microclimate, which is a heated RCLI that emits water vapor onto the cushion surface during the test. So we load that indenter onto the cushion and wait about three hours for that water vapor to brew on the cushion surface. And we look at the temperature and relative humidity um, that's measured at the interface. And with that, we'll switch gears a little bit over to stability. So we've talked all about these different features and um, related to skin protection and immersion and envelopment and other factors there. But let's start talking a little bit about the cushion's ability to stabilize the pelvis and talk about alignment and positioning. So a lot of marketing language um, around stability. So there's optimal stability, about 50% mention these things. There's increased stability, lateral and forward stability, side to side stability, greater sitting stability, um, specially contoured to provide balance and stability. Um, functional stability and um, looking for, you know, good for individuals with increased sit and stability. <clears throat> and with that, we can talk about two tests, one of which we've created. Um, it's called the lateral stability test. So Tricia, Dave, and I had a <clears throat> good portion in developing the ISO standard for lateral stability and um, where you can measure the tilt angle. And then impact damping, which is another one, which we'll tell you about that tells you kind of how bouncy your cushion is. So how stable will the person feel? So we'll start with lateral stability. <coughs> Excuse me. So the stability test itself, we use an RCLI again, but this time it's covered in jeans or denim. 
we add a dead load, which sits on top of it. And then we add a live load to it, which has a roller on the bottom of it. We make sure the indenter is level on the cushion. And then we go ahead and shift the center of mass of the indenter to create a, a, a loaded tilt position on the indenter in the cushion. We wait 60 seconds and then we see how much that indenter has tilted on the cushion itself. So we measure that tilt angle in degrees, which is the change in orientation of that indenter after that lateral shift in the center of mass of the indenter. And we measure it every 10 seconds for 60 seconds following the shift. So basically how much have you tilted in the cushion? So we look for low tilt angles to support marketing language that a cushion has lateral or side to side stability. So if you see marketing language like provides functional stability, look for low tilt angles. So look for cushions that don't make you kind of feel like you're falling over on the side of the cushion too much. So those are the, gonna be the cushions with lower tilt angle. So here on the left side of the graph. And the last test that we can discuss would be impact damping. So your impact damping test is a test that uses a weighted rigid cushion loading indenter. So this indenter itself, it weighs about 500 newtons. It has an accelerometer sitting on top of it. And we raise that platform up to a 10 degree angle using a little peg. So that peg then is removed and we let the indenter fall on the cushion and, and the whole platform fall. And the accelerometer will collect basically how that indenter is kind of bouncing on the surface or how much is it dampening um, kind of the, the force of that fall. And here's an example of that that you can watch. So you can see here how it follows the pattern of kind of that bounce. And we just see how the cushion reacts to that. And in doing so, we look at the impact ratio. The impact ratio is a ratio of the second impact to the initial impact expressed as a percentage. And what we mean by that is that a low impact ratio supports marketing language that a cushion promotes balance and stability. So with that, a low impact ratio looks something like this here on the right side of the screen. So you can see here how even though that first impact is large, it very quickly dampens. So this cushion itself would be very stable. So you wouldn't be bouncing around. This on the other side here, you see a high impact ratio. This is gonna be a cushion that's bouncing a lot. So you're gonna be very, um, you're gonna be moving around a lot in your cushion. And neither of these are necessarily bad, um, but for someone who maybe feels a little bit more insecure in, in a cushion that's bouncing, um, you would definitely want to have someone in a lower, lower impact ratio cushion. So you can see that here. And again, if you see marketing language like greater sitting stability, you would look for a low impact ratio. So something on this right side of the screen here. All right, so we've covered all of these different terms pretty quickly. So we're here to talk a little bit more about those if you have questions. But overall, we really just wanna challenge you now, <laughs> um, manufacturers again, to back up those marketing claims. So you have some examples of concrete meaningful data that you could use to back up some of the claims that we talked about. And similarly, healthcare professionals and wheelchair users, um, we encourage you to ask questions about the meaning of data starting today. So when we start having this conversation now, um, we really want you to ask us questions. You know, what does this mean when I see these things? Or do you have a test for this? Or show me the data. Ask those questions, it's very important um, and can help you in the long run to understand it. If you'd like to learn more about our efforts and what we're doing to talk about standards and make connections to the outside world, if you will, 
please visit us on our website at wheelchairstandards.pit.edu um, or follow us on LinkedIn here again um, with the QR code. We're very QR code heavy in this presentation, but <laughs> feel free to, to scan that now if you'd like. Um, and also feel free to contact us. We, we love answering questions and are also a wheelchair cushion testing facility. So if you're interested in having your cushions tested or consulting with us about that, please do email us at timlab uh, at pit.edu. There is an underscore in there that's covered by the underline, but please do contact us for that. We love working with you all. So um, with that, I'll open it up for questions that we have and really encourage that based on today's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. So we, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first is about um, asking if consideration has been given to um, two factors. One is the time that the tests are run and how time might influence the, the metrics that we measure, and also how size might um, influence the outcomes of the tests. Absolutely. So I will actually uh, answer the second part of that question first. So the size, the indenters that I spoke with you all about today, the different indenters do come in different sizes that can be sized up or down, depending on the cushions that we test. So the testing that we did uses a standard 16 by 16 cushion, which uses the standard size indenters. But we do have larger ones that can be used on larger cushions and smaller ones for smaller cushions. Um, so those that is one way we do accommodate for that. Um, but I'd be curious if you want to unmute and um, just ask about your kind of which which tests you were thinking about with the time, and we can kind of talk about that on a test by test basis. Yeah, I was really uh, concerned about the time, really, with many of the um, testing uh, areas. Just the, I mean, I would be concerned about the time related to pressure relief, related to stability related to shear, um, temperature regulation, how all those things change from the, you know, one to three minute time frame towards the eight, 10, 12 hour time frame, which is more real life to, to what these um, individuals use with their chairs and their cushions. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll let, I'll let Trisha or Dave also comment on this, but I think right off the top of my head, something that we wanna keep in mind too, is that we are just trying to characterize roughly what the cushion's performance would be. I think it's just to kind of simulate in a standardized way, this is what we do. We do simulate aging on the cushions, which is another type of testing that we can do that does look at it for a longer period of time. So we would do different tests that last up to a full day or several days of kind of simulating aging for those. But I'll defer to Trisha and Dave if you have any other thoughts on that time frame. Yeah, just um, a quick comment on the time. The, the, when the standard test methods were developed, they were developed you know, with a couple of goals in mind. And one of them was to give you know, repeatable, consistent results. And so generally, that means that the test is run to the output gets to some sort of steady state condition so that it's at the end of that time, it's, it's not changing anymore. So you know, keep in mind this, except for the stability test, um, these tests are very static. You know, the, the load is placed on it and the load's changed in some way, and then um, a measurement is taken. So there, isn't, there aren't any many environmental factors here. So um, in that way, I don't think the, the additional time would have that much um, influence on many of the results. Um, you know, the, the microclimate test may be an exception to that because that is an accumulation of moisture due to the water vapor being um, continuously emitted onto the uh, surface of the cushion. But the, the goal is to compare cushion performance, performance. And so we pick a time point, um, hopefully steady state, but if not, at least it's the same for every cushion so that the results can be compared to, from one cushion to another cushion. Trisha, did you have another take on that? No, I think that, that uh, qualified it well. The next um, comment actually talked about um, how the performance of the cushion changes with the age of the cushion, which is the other aspect of that question, right? That it is um, not so much the end of the day, but overuse and time. And it does depend on the user 
and the type of user, right? So, um, but some of the work that we're doing is to simulate common challenges, repeated loading, um, you know, over aging and change of material properties over time, uh, disinfection and um, laundering, and then look at changes in performance after aging. So we are looking at some of those things and some of that data is available on that data exploration tool. Mm -hmm. And we do see changes over time. Yeah, we have a recent publication on a study that we did looking at the effect of aging. And I, I don't know if you can come up with that quick, Tricia, but maybe you could put a link to the, uh, the abstract yep. online. I'll try to find that, yep. You guys hit the, can do the next question. So the next question asked, um, how do wood models take into <clears throat> account the tissue deformation that occurs? And so um, that, that's a really interesting question. And you know, most of these tests measure what the inventor does to the cushion, not what the cushion does to the inventor. And uh, that's, that's kind of the, um, the mode that they're operating in. But of course, we recognize that you know, what's important when a person sits on a cushion is what the cushion does to the person, not the other way around. And so we, with that in mind, there are some tests under development that use compliant inventors and measure metrics that measure how the compliant indenter is changed by applying it to the cushion. And, and in particular, um, you know, that's relevant to, um, well, sim similar in some ways to envelopment, but uh, I, th I think you're, you're kind of right on in, in, in posing this question about, you know, what does the cushion do to the person? There was a methodology that's been developed at, at Georgia Tech, which um, takes that exact approach. And we're, we're very interested to evaluate that and possibly bring that into the standards portfolio. Another thing to take into consideration too with the wood is that because they're standardized tests for, the, for that, those particular tests that we mentioned too, you just have the repeatability of the fact that you have a solid indenter. So for that, where you're testing the cushion rather than the person, you're kind of considering something that's gonna be the same each time versus having the complexity of the deforming bottom. So that's something else to keep in mind. And, and one limitation you could say of, of that. Alex, I'm wondering if you found any marketing language around deformation. All right, so I, is that a question from you or the audience? I don't that, know. That's a question for you. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Um, no, so around deformation. So with deformation, we did see it was categorized around kind of a lot of times around envelopment or conforming to the user's bottom. So I talked a little bit about um, allows, it was more about the cushion deforming. So the cushion deformed to um, envelop the bottom or deformed to conform to the user. So it was more about the cushion rather than the tissue deforming, if you will. And then a lot of the tissue deforming would then come under the skin protection. So providing pressure relief, providing tissue integrity, um, promises, those type of things. So those are the two kind of ways that deforming came into that and where they would be found under what we talked about today. There's another question about um, the possibility of introducing a common um, asymmetry. Uh, into the um, test procedures. In other words, maybe a pelvic obliquity, for example, um, and applying a, a, a load that would represent an obliquity and whether or not um, that would be, I guess, worth, well, I'm reading into the question now, but whether or not that would give us more information. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be a really neat thing. I think there's different versions of this that I know we've tested in the past that we've done. We have an extreme indenter which looks at someone who has a very extreme anatomy. So very, very kind of narrow pelvis, kind of intense ITs. Um, we've looked at that. I could imagine there would be another version of that where you could do some sort of pelvic obliquity. I think you'd have to um, probably modify the test a little bit here and there to accommodate for that, but it could be something else like, like the extreme indenter, like a deformable, uh, butt shape. You could do different versions of that. It could be interesting results and, and things to talk about in the future for sure. Um, someone asked if we are, um, are making the slides available. 
and if the information on the website is downloadable. Um, we hadn't planned on making the slides available. However, this recording, um, as those of you who are watching this recorded know, will be available for about a year on the ISS website. So you can, you can review it there. Um, we haven't, um, we haven't uh, decided exactly how the, the data um, will be distributed other than you know, the way it is now on the website in a, in a um, graphical format. Um, but it, we don't, well, I'll just leave it at that. It's okay, somebody did just ask for it. Code. Okay, did they? Oh, that was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go. I'll go ahead and put that. I will just say a quick plug as well for an additional standards uh, presentation that's coming up on Wednesday. So there's going to be another one talking about ISO standards and the um, as they apply to clinical reasoning. So we do encourage you to also check that out. Um, some awesome colleagues also doing that. So check that one out on Wednesday. It's 945 to 1045 um, talking about ISO standards. And then I can put the CEU code up as well. Yes, it's A E two J G nine, and I will uh, put that into the um, chat as well. Did I miss any of the questions? What I saw, I think we covered them. But if anyone else has any questions, feel free to feel free to unmute or throw them in the chat. Yeah, we have a little bit of time left. So if um, if there are any comments, um, we'd welcome those now. You can just uh, unmute and all right. Well, not hearing anything, I think we will bring this uh, session to a close then. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for watching. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Great job. Oh, thank you, Kim. Yeah. <laughs>